Well, let's stand together, please, for the reading of God's word and open your Bible to the uh, gospel of the gospel of Matthew and find chapter number 28, verse 18, and also chapter 24. So kind of find chapter 28, 18. We'll look at that verse and then we're going to move over to chapter 24. Look at one verse there and that's verse 14. So Matthew 28, 18 and Matthew 24, 14 for the reading this morning. And then we'll get into the message. Now I praise the Lord that he is Lord. And not Gavin Newsom. I praise the Lord that he is Lord. And not President Trump. Amen. I praise the Lord that he is Lord. Not Jerry Scheidbach. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd get particularly glad right about there. Amen. I'm glad that he is Lord and not you. <laughs> I'm glad that Jesus is Lord. And he rose from the grave with this declaration. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, we've examined that great truth quite a lot here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. And so you're pretty well instructed in all that goes behind that major announcement. We're going to read it again. I want you to understand that the word power here translates exousia, and it means authority or right to rule. And Jesus rose from the grave, finally got his disciples gathered to that mountain in Galilee where he had appointed them to meet after the resurrection. And that took some doing. It takes some doing to get us to do what he's called us and told us to do, doesn't it? He finally got him there. And when he got him there, he made his declaration. All power, all authority, all right to rule is given unto me, Jesus said. In heaven, oh, well, we know that. That's fine. He didn't stop there, though. He said, and in earth. Now go over to Matthew 24 and let's look at verse 14. Where he gives us a promise concerning the gospel of the kingdom. Now, look, there's the gospel of grace and the gospel of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of peace. And guess what? It's all one gospel. There's only one gospel, there's not several different gospels. If you come up with any other gospel than the gospel, you got the wrong gospel. So all of these expressions simply tell us something about the gospel. And here we're learning something about the gospel. That it is the gospel of the kingdom. The Bible says in Matthew 24 verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And give special attention to the clause that follows. And then shall the end come. Father, help me to preach in these to hear what you have for us today, Lord. As my heart is full, Lord. I, I trust with the message you have intended for us this morning. As we think about making sure we keep the focus on the right thing we got a lot going on lord that can easily distract us and distract our hearts away from where your heart is centered and where your heart is focused so i just felt led some time back lord to stop and and uh, make sure my own heart is focused where your heart is and so that our church also, Lord Jesus, might be focused where you want us focused. All the other things are important, Lord, but they are periphery. And I pray you'll help us to realize that. In Jesus' name I pray and ask for this. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. The main work of the church is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the most important things we do as a church is get out there and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, to witness, to tell our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbors about the gospel, Jesus Christ's death on the cross of Calvary, his burial and his resurrection and what that means. 
the, import, the importance of that great event in history where God, who provided his own son, is sacrificed for us that we might be saved from the wrath to come. There's a lot in that. And we need to make sure that we stay focused on the main job. We have a lot to distract us right now with this COVID nonsense and everything. And, and I think we need to address those things. I think it's appropriate that we should uh, speak up, speak the truth to every lie Satan tries to use to confuse people's minds and, well, distract them from the gospel. Because not only is it important that we don't allow all this stuff to distract us from the main thing, we can't allow the devil to use it to keep the hearts of those around us from looking where they need to look right now at this time. That's to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I, I want to uh, take today to remind you of the importance of missions, the work of extending our ministry around the world through support of missions. And so we have a missionary with us who's uh, in Papua New Guinea. Well, actually, he's here right now, but uh, he serves in Papua New Guinea, and he'll be preaching in the next hour, and I'm looking forward to hearing his message, and I'll uh, introduce him, uh, you know, at the end of this message today, and uh, I want you to think about missions, and let's pray that God perhaps will allow us to have a, a part in his ministry there in Papua New Guinea, and, um, and also that God will help us have the support we need to maintain the commitments we've made to our current uh, group of missionaries. So we're talking about missions this morning. Let's go ahead and get into this. Jesus is the king. All mankind are his subjects. He conquered the devil. And he bought the world. He beat the devil. Whooped him. Defeated him. And the Bible says cast him out. John 12, 32, Jesus said that the prince of this world is judged. And he'll be cast out. Of course, we look around and say, wow, if, he's, if he can do what he's doing down here right now, being cast out, Lord have mercy when he comes. And interestingly enough, that's what the Bible says. Read Revelation chapter 12. When he's cast out and cast to the earth, the Bible says, woe unto the earth. Yeah, he's working a whole lot of mischief right now as prince of the power of the air. He was prince of the world. He is no longer prince of the world. He was cast out. Now he's prince of the power of the air. And he is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. And look at the mischief he's causing in the earth right now in that capacity. No wonder in Revelation 12, when Michael finally whoops him and casts him down to the earth, the Bible says, woe unto the earth, because he's coming with great, great wrath. But right now, you understand the situation? The Spirit of Jesus Christ has been sent into the world to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Jesus spoke to this so often in his ministry, beginning in John chapter 7, when he told us that out of our belly would flow rivers of living water, and the Holy Spirit comes behind that statement and says, hey, he's talking about me. Uh, the Holy Ghost had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Newsflash, he's been glorified. Holy Ghost has been given. Now the Spirit of Jesus Christ who dwells in us is to fill us and flow through us. And the spirit that is in us is greater than the spirit that is in this world. The spirit of Jesus Christ in us and who moves through us is greater than the spirit that operates in the children of disobedience. So how is it that it seems... They are, and by they, you know who I mean, the children of disobedience. The children who refuse the gospel. Those who cry out, we will not have that man to reign over us. Luke chapter 19, verses 12 to 27. You got to read that parable and pay attention to it. Jesus is the king. 
He's gone to get an eternal kingdom, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have this one right now. Jesus is king of the kingdom of men. It belongs to him. And he's going to come back again with that kingdom that is to come. But he is sovereign over the kingdoms that are. That's what he said in verse 18 of chapter 28. When he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He declared himself to be the ultimate sovereign ruler of the earth. Whoa. <clears throat> no wonder tyrants don't like him. He gets in their way. In any event, it all belongs to him. He's the conquering king, and he has sent us out to deliver to all mankind the terms of surrender. Most preachers today behave like salesmen. Like they're selling a product. And so when you're selling a product, you know, you got to be careful about not raising objections. Right? You don't want to, you want to avoid the negatives of your product. I mean, if you have a product that includes stuff like, if you don't buy my product, you're going to go to hellfire and burn. It's a little bit of a negative. You might turn people off. So you don't want to talk about that. And you can go on from there and understand what I'm saying. But that's what's happened. So many Christians have become salesmen. But God did not call us to be salesmen. He called us to be soldiers. We are soldiers and we're supposed to go forth declaring the terms of surrender. And the terms of surrender are very clear. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And in verse 13 of that passage that begins in Romans 10 verse 9, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, Lord. You must confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you must call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what he's saying when he declared all powers given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus Christ being Lord means that he is head over all, sovereign over all, king over all. Ruler over all. That's what it means. And when we confess with our mouth that He is Lord, we're saying something that's very significant and very important. We're saying that Jesus is Lord and you're not. Jesus is Lord and I'm not. Jesus is Lord and the state is not. Jesus is Lord and no man can take that title and no man can assert that place in our lives but Jesus, Jesus alone. And that's where the gospel of the kingdom comes in. That's what the gospel of the kingdom is about. When, when the expression gospel of the kingdom is used, this is the aspect of the gospel it's focusing on. Now we could talk about the gospel of God. And that would be the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel of God. Praise God for the gospel of God. There's the gospel of peace which declares the reconciliation between the sinner and God. We are brought into peace with God and we have the peace of God. He extends peace. That's what he said in the declaration of, at his son's birth, peace on earth. That was his offer. He offers peace. And when we go gospelizing, or when we go evangelizing, telling people about Jesus Christ, we are offering them the peace of God. Did you know that? You knock on the door, they ask you, say, I've come to bring the peace of God to you. 
Well, we don't usually say that, but we usually say something like, if he died right now, would you sure you go to heaven? <laughs> it's a good clarifying question. But literally, you are offering the terms of peace, of reconciliation, the gospel of peace. He died upon the cross of Calvary. He was for our sins. He was buried. He rose again, according to scriptures, physically, and as king over all things, having received from the Father the kingdom of man into his hands. Yeah, Satan said earlier, in the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, all the kingdoms of the world are given to me and to whomever I give them. And Jesus, who straightened him out every time he said something wrong during that ordeal, by the way, right? Satan used a verse and tried to get Jesus to jump off a pinnacle, this kind of thing. And Jesus corrected him, corrected him. Correct. He didn't correct that because it was true. God had given at that time in history, God had given to Satan all the kingdoms of the world. But then the father sent his son to take him back. And that's what he did. And Jesus came and he bound that strong man and whooped him and then on the cross defeated him <clears throat> because he paid the wages of sin, breaking the power of Satan over mankind who had the power of death but no longer has it. And Jesus rose again, defeating the grave and defeating death and declaring himself to be now possessor of all power over heaven and over earth. So our Lord Jesus Christ, in the gospel of peace, offers reconciliation with God. In the gospel of God, offers a sacrifice that God accepts as an atonement, as payment for all our sins. They have the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the declaration that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again. And here you have the gospel of the kingdom. Again, it's the same gospel every time. But when I go to a door and I offer the gospel of peace, Jesus told us that if they don't receive it, then you are to withdraw your peace from that house. Wow. So those, we offer someone the gospel of peace, if they reject it, we, basically we say, okay, offer withdrawn. That doesn't mean they can't have it offered by somebody else, but... <laughs> Amen. But that's what Jesus said. Boy, if we, if, if, he's talking to this woman at the well, right? And he's telling her, you know, I have the water of life. And she says, well, give me this water that I may drink and never thirst again and not have to come here to draw anymore. And Jesus says, okay, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You're honest. That's good. You're truthful. That's good. You've had five. The fellow you're shacking with now is not your husband. And somebody should come get Jesus. Take him aside. And say, Jesus, don't you know how to be a soul winner? That's not how you do things. I mean, the lady asked for the water. Give her the water for heaven's sake. You know, tell her, bow your head, repeat after me. Isn't that what we're trained to do? Somebody says, okay, okay, I want your water. Bow your head, repeat after me. Jesus says, go get your husband. He brings out a sin in her life. He brings out an issue of separation between her and God. He points at it. And believe me when I tell you, that wasn't the only issue of separation between her and God. Do you understand? That was not the only issue of separation between her and God. He didn't like, go through a long list of every area in her life where she was failing. He pointed to a specific area of her life where it would bring conviction for her sin and make her recognize the truth that she is a sinner and that she needs, she was being flippant in her attitude. And Jesus Christ challenged her conscience. Well, if you, if you try to win people to Christ that way, you're not going to win very many people to Christ. I'll tell you what, I'll win more people to Christ that way than you ever will with your sales techniques. Oh, you'll get a whole lot more people to bow their head and pray than I will. But I guarantee you, you won't see very many of them in heaven. 
The Bible says that many will gather in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have not we this, have not we that? And Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. I don't know you. We ask the question, do you know the Lord? But the bigger question is, does he know you? That's the bigger one. So we're not salesmen. We're soldiers. And we're declaring the gospel of the kingdom. And I find this fascinating that in the gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is talking about the end, he tells us that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations for a witness. Again, that's not to say it doesn't include the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of peace, and so on. Because there's only one gospel. But you get what I am saying is, hmm, that'll be the focus of the gospel preached in the end. I'm something of a student of history. did my Bachelor uh, of Arts degree thesis on revival and studied the history of revivals, uh, Scotland and England, and, but particularly my interest was in America. And as I studied them, I, did, I noticed an interesting thing. I noticed that God raised up preachers who, who preached the gospel, of course, in every era, if you want to call it that, during, uh, with every revival. And it was interesting to me how, for example, if you contrast, let's say, D.L. Moody with, with Billy Sunday, it's interesting. Billy Sunday was a preacher of righteousness, the gospel of righteousness. God is a God of righteousness. Well, D.L. Moody preached, he emphasized God's a God of love. Hey, are both things true about God? How about, yeah. But it was just interesting to me. And then Finney had his own emphasis and so on. It's just interesting that, that when we come to the end, according to Jesus Christ, his prophecy is that in the end time, we're, we're, when, when the preaching goes forward, that covers the whole earth, precedent to the end, it's going to be the gospel of the kingdom. That will be the emphasis. The gospel of the kingdom. Now let's look at this passage for a moment and, <clears throat> and let me um, offer some insight that I think will be helpful to you. But since I've gone so far afield from my notes, I have to find where I was there. Okay. All right, go ahead and open your Bible to Daniel 8. Find Daniel chapter 8. I ask you to give special attention to that clause that concludes verse 14. And then shall the end come. That expression, the end, is actually a very specific prophetic period. It's not just a vague generalization. In other words, he's not just simply saying, this will happen and then we'll be done. That's like a, like a summary statement to conclude something where you don't want to bother with any further detail. I kind of addressed that a little bit this morning in my Bible study, how some writers will write on a subject and they get tired of it, I guess, or something. And then so they just wrap it up with a superficial paragraph that concludes and we're done and, and goes on. And they go on. That's not what Jesus is doing here. He's not just, you know... And I don't want to bother with any further details, so I'll just say, and then the end comes. No, it's very precise language. He's referring very specifically to a period of, of prophetic history that is referred to as the time of the end. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? To give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. How many of you know that this reference to the transgression of desolation is also a reference to something called the abomination of desolation? I got to see how much work I got to do here today. If you don't know that, we got another 20 minutes I have to add to the message. Now how many of you know that? That's what I thought. It's amazing how smart you get when you have a challenge like that. <laughs> But it's true. The transgression of desolation is the abomination of desolation. Jesus speaks about the abomination of desolation in this passage. In fact, it's the very next verse. 
When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And so we, uh, we know that the man of sin is going to put the image of jealousy in the temple of God. He's going to put that in the holy place. And when you see that happen, you're in trouble. So my point is, do you see how verse 14 is in that context? Verse 14 is followed by 15. That's something McCracken would do, right? So I'm going to get you ready for Brother McCracken's coming in January here. So everybody caught that, right? Verse 14 comes just right before verse 15. And so the context is, he says, the end will come. And the next thing he says is he talks about something that happens in a period Daniel referred to as the time of the end. Let me show that to you further. Continuing our reading in Daniel chapter number 8. To give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. <clears throat> if you want some fascinating insight on those 2,300 days, you need to get my commentary on Daniel. But we don't have time to go into that right now. Because then we'd have to add two hours to the, to the message. And I'm sure you don't want that. Verse number 15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. When Jesus said in verse 14 that the gospel of the kingdom, or this gospel of the kingdom will be preached among all nations for a testimony to witness to all men and so on, he said that will happen and then this will happen. First that happens, then this happens. There's another passage that talks about what happens first before this. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We won't take time now to go and study, but it's true that that which withholdeth will withhold until he be taken out of the way. I believe it's a reference to the Holy Spirit present here in the Lord's church that will be taken out, be removed. And when he, the restraining Holy Spirit, the spirit greater than the spirit in this world, the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in the world, according to the Apostle John, is the spirit of Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience being identified as those who reject the gospel, who reject Christ's claim to be king, Christ's claim to be Lord. They reject that. So the heathen rage and imagine a vain things, and the kings of the earth set themselves and, and to take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed means Christ. And they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That spirit that operates in the children of disobedience that hate Jesus Christ. Unless you're talking about some sweetie pie who feeds people. Make sure they have something to eat and heals them. They like him. That's that John 6 crowd, you know. Some of you know enough Bible to know I'm preaching it. That John 6 crowd. They came, followed him all over because they liked the way he cooked lunch. That's what they liked about him. But when he said something like, eat my flesh, drink my blood, they said, what? And so his disciples came to him and said, Lord, you can't talk like that. You're making him, 
you're making him sick. I paraphrase that part. I've just made that up. But you, you get the idea. I'm giving you the gist of what's going on here in this story in John 6. He says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. They have no part in me. They said, I don't want to eat your flesh or eat your blood. I want another basket of fish. I'll take some more of that bread you, you, you distributed earlier. Uh, I, want, I don't want to eat your flesh or drink your blood. What's this eat your flesh, drink your blood stuff about? And so when the disciples came to Jesus and said, you know, these guys are really getting upset about what you're saying. Jesus said, I'll take care of it. So he went back out in front of him. He said, unless you eat my flesh, he said, actually, he went, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And he looks at his voice and says, how, how, how's that? And you're getting the point. And so they all leave him. And they don't want to follow this guy anymore. He's crazy. So they all leave. He's got his 12 sat in front of him. He looks at them and says, will you also go away? Wow. When Peter, who would often speak up in weird, awkward, silent moments, <laughs> said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Then Jesus said, okay, I'll explain to you. Uh, what I'm saying to you is spirit and truth. Not flesh, not physical, spiritual. People like the physical Jesus who feeds people and heals them, but they don't want the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want Master and Lord. They don't want king of kings and lord of lords. They don't want somebody who actually assumes the authority to, well, <laughs> tell them what to do. They don't want that one. So the world is fine with sweetie pie Jesus, you know, the little baby in the, in the uh, manger kind of thing. They're okay with all that, but he grows up and wants to tell people how to live. That's, <laughs> that's something else. They don't want him. And so what they don't want is who Jesus is. Who he truly is. And they rage against him. And they're motivated by that spirit of Antichrist that's operating in the world that is opposed to the spirit of Jesus Christ. But the spirit of Jesus Christ has come. And he is in us and moves through us. And he's greater than the spirit of Antichrist. And Jesus said that before the man of sin can rise, before the uh, Antichrist can come, the personality that the Antichrist spirit is preparing the world to receive. Before that can happen, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And that's our job. That's what we are here to do. We're here to preach this gospel of the kingdom to every place in the whole world, including Papua New Guinea. Including all over America. Including your neighbor's house, too, by the way. Including sidewalks that, that, uh, where people come to kill them, their little unborn baby. That's a, that's a mission field right there, too. Beginning in the first week of August, we're going to set up a training time for you to learn how to be a witness to these young ladies, usually, who are coming. Well, not always. Sometimes they're the older ladies, too. But they'll come looking for relief, looking for a way out of their dilemma. And you'll be there to show them a better way. And we'll start that in the first week of August. I, I, said, I said August, didn't I? We're in the first week of August. Thank you, Brother Mike. Okay. You, yeah, no, go ahead. Go out there. Just, anyway, be, I think it'd be good to have the training that Brother Mike and Alicia is going to provide for us. My, Brother Mike's going to give us a little course on this. I'm looking forward to that. But that'll be the first week of September. So glad to get that clarified. Had many of you panicked. What? But this is what we're here to do is to get the gospel out. And we need to support our missionaries. We've got a missionary in Canada 
We've got missionaries in uh, Fiji. We have missionaries in Croatia, Laos. We've got missionaries in uh, uh, China, yeah, and in Hong Kong, which are not the same thing. But anyway, we have missionaries in all these different places, and we have our evangelists that we support, like Brother Beckham and Brother Dave McCracken and Brother Abbott, and then our training institution that we support, West Coast Baptist College, and and we, we support these works because all of these works further this main job. That's to get the gospel out to all the world. And of course, we support Lighthouse Baptist Church to the same end. We want to do what Jesus said. His plan was both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. We need to, we need to do both. We need to do our part. And so let me finish that way. We need to support our missionary efforts, our, evangeliz- uh, our evangelism efforts with our presence. That's P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S in case you didn't know which presence I'm talking about. In Romans 13, 15 to 16, it says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's why I wear very pretty socks. Yeah. All right, this is the, this is the fun part of the message. Enjoy it while you can. But... The <laughs> But they have not all obeyed, the Bible says. They have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction, Paul said in Philippians 4.14. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. And when you communicate with a missionary, it's a good idea to add a little something to it. (laughs) In other words, when he says communicate here, he doesn't mean they had a conversation. What he means is he imparted to, or they imparted to Paul, things he needed for the work he was doing. That's what that meant. So he didn't just simply write him a letter, although a letter is very welcome. And I would encourage you to write a letter to our missionaries and to communicate with them in that way, to let them know you're praying for them and so on. But the idea here is that they presented to the Apostle Paul, those things he needed to sustain him in the work God called him to do. But not only do we support our missionaries with our presence, we also support missions with our presence. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. You didn't know you came to church to learn how to spell, did you? We also support missions with our presence. And I mentioned some of it already. When we uh, resume our door knocking efforts, join us if you can. That's the organized effort for the church to get out and give the gospel to our community. When we get our abortion, you know, our Planned Parenthood uh, group together to go out and do some sidewalk counseling to present the gospel. Uh, the real hope for these people in their situation and their crisis. When we do that, if you can, participate. But whether or not you are able, because of your schedule or whatever, to participate in some of these organized efforts, every single one of us is commissioned by Jesus Christ to be a witness. Each one of us. You've heard me say it many times, No organized ministry of outreach in any church is worth shooting if you don't have people who care about souls and who are soul winners to do it. Right? And I understand not everybody can can be there every Saturday and not everybody can go out to the the sidewalks, you know, uh, whenever we do that. And so I understand that. I would would hope we will have a presence there and I hope we'll have a group that will go out and, and, and give the gospel to our community. We need that kind of help. But my friend, you need to be a soul winner wherever you go, wherever you are. You need to give the gospel 
at every opportunity that you have. And you should look for opportunities to create opportunities. We need to be soul conscious, in other words. You need to understand that everybody you meet is going to go to heaven or hell. Everybody. And there isn't anybody who doesn't need the gospel. Everybody you meet needs to hear about Jesus Christ and his saving power and his saving grace. We need to be conscious of the fact that we've got a job to do, and that is to deliver the terms of surrender to everybody. Isaiah said that he heard the Lord, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then Isaiah said, There is him. Take him. No, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. You've got to personalize this call. Personalize it. Make it your call. That doesn't mean everybody here needs to pack their bags and join the Muldoons in Papua New Guinea. It doesn't mean every one of you need to, you know, sell out your homestead here and head to Russia. It does mean, though, you need to be sold out to Christ to be willing to speak the gospel to all your friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. It does mean that. You do need to do that. And you need to do it with prayer, too. With our presence, with our presence, with our prayers. We need to pray. The Apostle Paul asked for prayer. He said, we're supposed to go with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. For what, Paul? What's on on the top of your prayer request list? You've asked us to pray for you. What's the number one thing I should pray about? Here's what he said. That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That was the top of his prayer list. That utterance would be given unto me. What does that mean? Well, you could, you could take it in several different ways that are appropriate applications. The essential meaning is, though, that he would have opportunities to preach. That's the essential way he's asking for. Door, that doors would be open. To give him opportunities to preach. But you might also add to that. He wanted us to pray that God will help him have what he needs to say. When he's standing on Mars Hill. Lord give me what to say. When he's talking to those riotous rabble rousers over there. uh, In in Greece or elsewhere. He wants to know. He wants God to help him know what to say. Give him utterance. I need that. I need you to pray that God will help me to know what to say. And. And that God will give me opportunities to say it. And you also need to pray that God will give you what to say and opportunities to say it. It's very important for us that we preach the gospel of the kingdom. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.25, Brethren, pray for us. In 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us. And he added that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Paul understood the need for God's people to pray against the power of Satan and the spirit that operates in the children of disobedience to pray against them who try to oppose us in the work God's called us to do. Yeah, one reason it's important to pray for our rulers and those in authority is that we could live at peace. And and because, you know, God's greatest desire is for us to all be able to have our hammock handy so we can just stretch out and sip tea. No, He wants us to have peace so we can preach. So we can get the job done. So we can do the work we've been sent here to do. So we, knew, we do need to pray for those in authority and so on that we might live peaceable lives so we can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ freely without interference from the government, without interference from 
wicked people in the community who want to rise up and try to stop us from getting his message out. And there are those there who want to and who rage against the authority of Christ who, who say, we'll not have that man to reign over us. Uh, I know I wrote this book, God's War, Why Christians Should Rule the World. Boy, that tweaks people. I struggled with that title, quite frankly. I thought maybe I should be a little more clever and hide that statement in the book and not just put it out there like that. Maybe what I should say is something a little more benign and, and I got a little bit of uh, salesmanitis. But then I got on my face before God and I got all soldiered up. I said, no, we're just going to say what, what we really mean here. This is the truth. Amen. Christians are going to rule the world. Everybody agrees with that. But the idea that they should do it now freaks people out. But I got to tell you something. You go back to our founding. Those men believed in God. They believed in Jesus Christ. They believed Jesus Christ was Lord. They believed that the Holy Spirit of God reigned over the earth. They believed some stuff that would probably school many of us. They believed the Bible was the word of God. They believed that you could not rule or govern men apart from the Bible. That's the kind of thing they believed. And they gave us a country that's organized to support our inalienable rights of liberty. So what has happened to that since we began giving power over that government to men who don't believe those things? What has happened? Well, we're losing our liberties. So I stand by my thesis. Jesus Christ is king. All mankind are his subjects. And we're a whole lot better off when Christians run things than we are when these lost people do. And by the way, the lost people are better off too. Everybody benefits when somebody with integrity and a sense of righteousness and understands right and wrong as it's taught in the Bible. When they are in control of the levers of power, everybody benefits. We need to be preaching this gospel of the kingdom. Let's stand together, please.